Hey guys, welcome to the Big Liberty Show. I'm your host, Big Daddy Liberty. I've got a special, special, special show for you today as we discuss something which is quite literally at the forefront of threatening every single South African in this country. The very same people who run ESCOM and SAA and Transnet and bail them out year after year are now looking to run a new SOE, a new state-owned enterprise in essence, called the National Health Insurance, which of course has a massive pool of money behind it, which would be the NHI Fund. Um, now you've uh, already seen our episode with Dr. Anthony Jeffrey, and I'll put the link on the screen with that one so you can have a watch at that one too, uh, where she goes into great detail as to the uh, sort of uh, behemoth of a monster that the national health insurance would be. But um, in studio today, I've got some special, special guests who will add on to this and give us greater perspective as to what the NHI will look like when it comes to your health care and how it's arranged and organized and how you um, ever increasingly are um, being removed from the decision making around your health care and it's being placed into the hands of politicians and the army of bureaucrats that will be manning the NHI. But um, instead of me waffling away, let me welcome our guest in the studio. We've got uh, Dr. Johan Sarfontaine who's a senior consultant and a contributor to the Free Market Foundation. Uh, Doc, how are you doing? Hi, good afternoon and good afternoon to everybody out there. Fantastic. And of course, a face that you guys are very used to here on the show, uh, one which has a smile today. Um, uh, <laughs> Maurice, how are you doing? <laughs> Maurice of Root, of course, is uh, our head of campaigns here at the IRR. Fellas, I'm going to hop straight into the conversation here. And Doc, I'm going to begin with you because really you you set out in vivid terms today um, just how how much of a mess, I suppose, the national health insurance uh, is. But anybody watching this is probably wondering, wondering, what is the NHI? So I think the aim of the NHI is, is admirable, but whether it's going to achieve it is a different thing. So the aim of MHI is for everybody to have access to free healthcare services in South Africa, of course, uh, nothing is free. You know, mm. somebody's got to pay for everything. And I think that's one of the big concerns at this stage is who pays for all of this. And then th the second concern is, you know, if we don't quite have enough money for this as we think we do, you know, what kind of services can you expect to get under NHI? And would that really be a, a progressive realization of access to health care? Mm. If you find that, that ma the man on the street that's currently accessing government services, along with all the waiting times and the poor quality, if they can now access, uh, uh, you know, private services, public services, but they have access to a smaller basket of services than they currently have. So, mm. so those members of the public with rare diseases that are expensive to treat that, that currently get treated in the state might not get treatment at all. Mm. Uh, you know, the, 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 the other concern we have here, and I'm going to have us take a step back because I want to give the viewer a, a strong sense of what the NHI is. Um, but, you know, we have a system right now in this country of, in in a weird kind of way, kind of universal healthcare, in the sense that if you are sick, you can walk into any state facility and receive treatment. Um, and often you pay a very nominal fee, if, if a fee at all, because um, you can be exempt from it. But the quality of that healthcare has always been the real central issue. Um, you know, one which moves a lot of middle class individuals towards private healthcare, for, for example. It's the quality issue more than anything else. Does the NHI fix the quality uh, uh, question. Well, it's interesting that you mentioned the, the universal health aspect of where we currently are, because you'll find that the, the World Bank in, at the end of 2017 did a report on universal health coverage in the world, and South Africa scored 69% Jesus. on the on the system as it was in 2010. That was prior to the fact when, when, the, when the increased uh, the tariff rate, uh, if you earn below uh, 350,000 rand, you don't have to pay at all. That mm. was instituted after that. So one would probably think that adds another 3 or 4% to the total. Mm. So, so yes, we do have quite a, quite a bit of universal health coverage at the moment. And yes, that report also said the quality is the big problem. Mm. And in South Africa, you know, implementing an NHI and thinking that's going to magically solve all the quality problems in the healthcare sector, you know, is, is wishful thinking, unfortunately. Mm. Um, 
one does need to start looking at at competent management in the state and you know until you get that aspect right you know there's no way of trying to get the quality levels in the state up to anything closely resembling the private sector mm. and i mean the p- private sector's got its issues as well you know there's issues with the costs of costs of it and mm-hmm. the eventually the sustainability of the private sector so our south africa i think we need to start looking at ways of achieving univer- larger access to universal mm. health coverage without having to create this massive single-payer system and thinking that that the ex- mere existence of that is going to solve all of these other mm. problems. Look, Doc, um, another major concern I have here is that, look, you have a situation where people who, who often argue that, look, they can't afford to see a doctor, right? They can't afford to access um, a private uh, medical uh, facility, then somehow happen to believe, and it's, er- it's an erroneous belief, right, that uh, slapping on a bureaucracy by way of uh, the state um, <laughs> and slapping on uh, you know, a political layer also, because that's what the NHI does, you know, it, it accords much more power to the national government and the min- national minister, and I'll have you talk us through that just now, somehow slapping on an additional bureaucracy will make it cheaper. Now, this is clearly not the case, and you had a wonderful graph that you, you presented today which almost pieced everything together and I'm going to ask you maybe to speak, uh, talk to us th- uh, through that graph sort of in your head. And I'm hoping you'll allow me to maybe put it up on, on, on the screen uh, with your permission, of course. Um, how is the NHI going to be organized? What, what does it suddenly do with um, the current role players like provincial governments and local governments? And what, what are the additional bureaucracies that are going to be introduced with the NHI? Yeah, so central to this whole uh, aspect would be the NHI fund, which uh, kind of sits in the middle of everything. And the NHI fund will be governed by a board of trustees and a big NHI fund administrator. And I mean, I think Anthea probably referenced the amount of people that might be needed to administer something of this size. Mm -hmm. That NHI fund will be funded by taxes, so a various number of taxes, which are all described. So you've got your provincial equitable share that's going to fall in there, and that's what the DA currently has a problem with. Mm -hmm. Then you've got your personal income tax surcharge that goes in there. There's going to be an employer tax. So in all in all, the you know, funding this is going to add to the cost of doing business in mm. South Africa, which is a problem. Then this NHI fund is going to contract directly with a, with a bunch of hospitals. So you've got your central, your tertiary hospitals, your secondary hospitals. All of those currently fall within the provinces. They'll be taken out of the province, fall under this single-payer N- NHI fund. Then uh, at a district level, you'll have the contracting unit for primary health care, which will then in turn render services at a district level. That will get paid from the NHI fund via some kind of um, a capitation model. Um, which in itself is also problematic because, you know, if, if people move into the district to access healthcare services, you know, then your money is going to lag that, you know, so you're going to treat patients which you're not getting paid for already, mm. um, you know, as, because one can assume there's going to be an administrative lag. That uh, district health unit will then have uh, community healthcare workers that travel out to the states. It will have those district hospitals that fall under there as well. And you'll, they'll be contracting with private providers, private GPs, um, uh, you know, speech therapists, occupational therapists, physios, all of these kind of allied healthcare professionals that mm. participate in the system. Then the provinces themselves, uh, they will only be responsible for emergency medical services. That's the only responsibility still sitting in the province. And that creates the question of what happens to the provincial health administration mm. and the staff employed there. Because... Um, you know, they, they can't sit around and do nothing mm. and then it's not going to be any money to pay for them, you know. And I think it's something that the unions might be a little bit concerned of is, is this potential job losses in the provincial health departments. Well, well, sorry, just as, as I interject, which is very funny because Kosatu, if you, if you saw the press conference where they announced this NHI bill, the first two speakers who were called friends of the NHI but really beneficiaries of the NHI, <coughs> the first two speakers who came up was Kosatu and um, the SACP and they were you know, lauding this this program. So it's kind of weird to have them say, you know, w- w- when I listen to you now, it's kind of weird to hear them say they, they uh, endorse this when there's a potential for their members to lose their employment. Yeah, look, I, I doubt whether either them or their members have ever read this bill in any kind of detail and followed the rhetoric and all of that, you mm. know. So there's a very real danger of that happening. Unfortunately, it's the design of the system, mm. and I don't think the unions have picked up on that, you mm. know. So so they're also driven by the ideology, same as the minister, without considering <coughs> the practical implications. Um then the, the, you will need additional uh, tax funding f- to, to fund this NHI fund, the administration of that. You'll need additional tax funding to fund what's left of the provincial 
um, administration departments because they don't render services to NHI and therefore they can't get funds from the NHI mm-hmm. fund. And then there's a district health management office, which is also another administrative body in the district level that will also need to be funded. Mm-hmm. Then from a private side, the NHI fund will be contracting with private hospitals. They mm-hmm. will be rendering services. Um, they talk about diagnosis-related groupers being used as a funding model, which means if a patient presents with a specific disease, there will be a specific reimbursement connected to that disease, and it will cover whatever happens to the patient in hospital. Then, uh, you know, the assumption of that, though, is that private specialists will be employed by hospitals mm. because there's a single fee being paid over, and, and that is what is concerning to private practitioners because, you know, half of them are not interested in work being employed by hospitals. They mm. feel that it impedes on their clinical autonomy and they don't <coughs> want to do that. Um, you know, the absence of any kind of model of paying private providers, uh, specialists at the moment outside of NA, uh, outside of the hospital environment mm. is going to create both a service delivery problem and the problem with, you know, providers being scared of the uncertainty and starting mm. to look at countries that do provide them with certainty. Mm. But, you know, a lot of patients need to be managed at a specialist level outside of hospital. You know, if you look at eye care, for instance, intravitreal injections for people with, with AMD, which is a kind of a progressive blinding disease, they they need ongoing treatment on a monthly basis. And there just doesn't seem to be any mechanism in place um, for these patients, you know, how do you pay for these ongoing treatments? And then finally, you've got the medical scheme industry, which will be pro- providing complementary cover. I think what is majorly different in this draft of the bill is is it's a subtle change in the wording, mm-hmm. but complementary cover is described as 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 cover from a insurer or a medical scheme that pays for personal health care service benefits not reimbursable by the NHI. Now. And, and then also in, in paragraph section 33, it refers to medical schemes providing complementary cover for services not reimbursed by the fund. Mm. So if you look at what those services potentially can be, if a private practitioner or a hospital decides not to contract with the NHI fund, those services will not be covered by the NHI fund. They're not reimbursable. And therefore, one can assume that complementary cover would mean those services can be covered by medical schemes, mm. which is very similar to the situation we're currently in, where uh, you know those of medical schemes access private providers and the medical scheme pays for it. Mm. The, the big issue here is that in, in an attempt to make this NHI bill as overpowering as possible, there's a clause in it that says that any uh, competing legislation, the NHI bill will supersede that, mm. excluding the Public mm. Finance Management Act and the Constitution. So if you... If you then go and see that perhaps the Medical Schemes Act or the Registrar of Medical Schemes might decide, well, he's not going to approve a plan option that that covers these private services for non-contracted NHI providers, Mm. the NHI Act will supersede that. So you can call upon the NHI Act to say that this Act says medical schemes can cover these services. So you as the CMS and you as the Medical Schemes Act cannot come and tell me as a medical scheme I'm not allowed to offer these services because Mm. the Act says I can and the Act is all powerful. So so it's quite ironic because I think many, you know, it was put in there to give this Act as much clout as possible and yet it's going to be counting against the principles of what they're trying to achieve. I Mm. mean, the other other thing that is specifically excluded in the NHI environment is the Competition Act. Mm. Now, you know, so provider groupings will not be able to be charged with collusion under the Competition Act, mm-hmm. you know, or something like that, which means that in essence, if if the three private hospital groups were to come together and say, well, we're going to withdraw all our services from NHI because we're not happy with the tariff you're offering, the competition law will not apply to that. Mm. It won't be seen as collusion. <coughs> and it can create a major service delivery problem and it can actually drive up costs in the NHI. Mm. And the same with any specific provider grouping, you know. Maurice, I'm going to come to you because... Um, and, you know, and Doc, I will come back to you just in a moment, but Maurice, the Doc has quite ably set out just how much of a problem this, this bill is, and really at the heart of it is throwing layers upon layers upon layers of bureaucracy mm. onto something which, by its very design also, just doesn't make sense, and there's some areas to it that just don't make sense. Um, 
South Africans have an experience of this right now. We have, and by the way, the other problem being, and Doc, I don't know if you agree with me on this one, the idea of the state being a single buyer, the largest buyer of healthcare services in this country, and it, through some godly power that it seems to think it has, um, being able to work out exactly where services are needed and what quantity, we know this doesn't work. SCOM is a very good example that tells us this doesn't work. Morris, two questions for you. What is the potential for corruption here? Because you now have a system where it's not open to competition. It's not open to real scrutiny mm. from uh, and accountability insofar as investing power in the central state, investing power in the national minister. What is the scope and the, re the, the, the probability, I suppose, I'm asking you to forecast here, of there being massive procurement corruption mm. in the NHI, given the size of the NHI fund, um, that you know it could be somewhere around maybe nearly 400 billion, Doc, I don't mm. know. Um, what is this, the, we've, we've seen this before, of course, but w what are we looking at here? Well, I think <clears throat> it goes without saying that there's going to be opportunities for corruption. And I mean, one of the best predictors of future behavior is past behavior. And we've seen what's happened at the place like ESCOM, Prasa, Transnet, levels of corruption being crazy. And part of the reason we have the problems with ESCOM today is because of state capture and corruption, mm. which saw a lot of problems in ESCOM and a lot of our other SOEs. And um, I think uh, uh, just to, we, we're talking about all these big amounts of, big amounts of money, but uh, one way I think uh, Johan had in his presentation, which is a very interesting way of describing how much it's going to cost us, uh, NHI is the equivalent of having four soccer World Cups every year. So, and I think we all know what a big effort uh, the World Cup in 2010 was, and that mm. was just one. So imagine four every year, and that's, and that's money, as Johan said in his presentation earlier, this is money that's been taken away from other, I mean, it could build so many houses, it could build so many schools, it could go to so many other uh, things to benefit people. Um, people who are actually going to suffer the most from NHI are poor, pe are poor mm. South Africans. You, Johan? Yeah. Um, well, actually, that is just the shortfall in taxes. That's uh, not yeah. even the total bill. So mm -hmm. that is that is the shortfall that we're going to have to get extra out of taxpayers is those four. We've got to fund four World Cups a year just to fund the shortfall on, Jeep, on what's going to yes. come. <laughs> and, and this is the point I was making earlier on to say that, you know, systems like these are incredibly cash hungry. I mean, one has to look around the world to see, uh, you know, various iterations of a national health system or initiative to see that, you know, Countries that have bigger tax bases, we're talking about this offline, and I'll let you guys comment on this. Countries that have bigger tax bases are pumping ever increasingly more and more money into their versions of the NHI. And the question becomes, where do we get the money, Johan? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is one of the issues. I think if you look at the NHS in the UK, and the UK has got about the same population as South Africa, you know, the NHS budget is about the equivalent of the South African gross domestic product annually. You know? So so it's huge. Um, they employ 1.3 million people in the NHI system, which is the equivalent of, of all South African government employees, and they've got that in NHS on its own. Then if you look at like Canada, you know, Canada, uh, Brazil, all of these examples that got used in the regional white paper, you know, <coughs> have since kind of fallen away. But, you know, Thailand gets used as an example, Korea gets used as an example, Brazil, uh, Canada, you know, all of these countries have unemployment rates sitting at about 4 or 5%. Mm -hmm. They've got tax bases of between 30 and 40% of the population paying for these things. And I really think if South Africa was in such a situation, you know, implementing the, this model of NHI probably wouldn't have been such a big issue because it would have been fairly affordable for us as a country. But we're not in that situation. And that's why us as South Africa, we need to start looking at alternative ways of achieving universal health coverage that does not bargain on taxpayers having to foot a massive bill to implement it, you mm. know, and, and we need to start getting creative on these things. And currently, government is so fixated on the ideology of NHI mm. that all practicalities are just going past them. Absolutely. It's crazy. And Johan, I think you've opened up my final question then. Um, we need to give the listener, the watcher of this, uh, the viewer of the show, um, an idea that alternatives do exist. We do not have to go down the the line, if you will, of the NHI, which is driven mostly by ideology. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea of essentially, and I'll say it here, it's a very sort of leftist Marxist ideology of centralizing power. Everything rests in the hand of the politician, the the, the army of officials, the army of, of bureaucrats, um, whereas actually there are market-friendly and really individual-friendly ways of organizing a universe and, and excuse me, ensuring universal <coughs> access to healthcare. I'm going to begin with you, Johan, um, as our guest. Uh, let me be polite. <laughs> um, if you 
were to be given the the annual spend of our healthcare right now, which is conservatively about 220 billion rand, how do you organize uh, healthcare in in South Africa to make it universal and market friendly and really patient friendly? I think we need to we need to actually take a step back before we go forward, and that yeah. is returning back to the social health insurance that was about to be implemented in 2007. If you make medical scheme membership mandatory for everybody that's employed, mm. and if we are able to make a minimum wage mandatory, we can make medical scheme membership mandatory as well. It falls in the same category. If you can do that, the cost of the private funding mm. sector would reduce by 20% for everybody in that sector. Mm. So that immediately reduces the costs of the private sector. It gets more people t- to be able to uh, access the private sector mm-hmm. through utilizing these medical scheme membership. That in turn will then give the state sector a breather because now the state has got less patients to look after. And if you can do that, then the state can start fixing the quality issues in the state. Mm. You know, And I mean, if our aim is to have access, free access to quality health care, that will actually go a long way for people um, that that cannot afford healthcare to have free access to quality healthcare. And I think even in NHI, those that can pay are going to pay for their services. So it's exactly the same in that system where this mandatory prepayment of medical scheme is there. Mm-hmm. So you know that is that is something that can be implemented next week without mm-hmm. having to re- massively reorganize the entire system. And it will improve quality in the state. It will reduce costs in the private sector. But I don't think there's the appetite from the government to take short-term steps that are going to massively improve the system because then the need for this ideology of NHI kind of falls away, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and it is ideology-driven based on Definitely. quality and price. And if quality and price are no longer issues, you know, then how, what do we drive NHI on? Mm-hmm. So, so that's why the appetite is simply not there from a political side to implement the measures that need to be implemented to help the system right now. Mm. Maurice? Um, Johannes said it out quite mm. aptly, I think, in, in this in this chat. But we've got our solutions in house here too, don't we? Um, um, well, um, what uh, we've suggested one of them is the expansion of um, the or we'll make it mandatory for people to be members of medical schemes, mm-hmm. and for people on lower incomes that could be paid for by the employer, and they could claim that back as a tax credit, uh, mm-hmm. for example. Also, the issue of uh, vouchers where we split up the whole. Uh, health department uh, budgets and mm-hmm. each South African gets X amount and they can choose where they want to buy a service from, whether it's a private or public provider. And it'll also uh, weed out the people who um, aren't uh, providing good services. So, I mean, that's one way of doing it. <clears throat> and also uh, what we have to do is uh, improve management of our government clinics and so on. I mean, we've seen uh, the issues. I mean, w- the last study showed that only 1% of government uh, facilities met the government's own standards, mm. which is shocking. But that's what's got to change. We've got to get rid of things like B. BE procurement, make mm-hmm. sure we're getting things at the correct price, at, uh, efficiently, and so on. We also, and uh, the government needs to stop seeing the private sector as an enemy, but yes. rather as a partner. We need more public-private uh, partnerships. I mean, when when, they, when the government and the p- uh, private sector work together, things work out fairly well. And we need to allow the private sector to be more involved in, say, things like day hospitals and, and so on. Mm. And also, I think we need to l- allow the private sector to uh, train more medical professionals. Uh, one of the reasons why places like Brazil and India have quite a good doctor-patient ratio compared to South Africa is because they allow private training of medical professionals where we don't. And that's something where, as I say, the government needs to stop thinking of the private sector as an enemy, but rather as a partner in South Africa's development. Absolutely. I mean, it's the idea of letting the market assist in providing the sort of quality services mm. <coughs> at a cheaper rate that we've seen in other things, right? I mean, other goods in this country that aren't regulated, that aren't subject to the state's ownership, have become cheaper and more accessible. And just as a final point, maybe from me, Morris, I'm a big, big, big fan of... We, we need to stop viewing poor South Africans in particular who've been excluded from mm. quality health care as charity cases. Uh, and as you said, break up the state's budget... Mm put it into vouchers and let people buy the medical aid, the medical insurance that has them access the quality services that, that Doc has mm. set out and that you could provide in alternatives. That is the real route to empowering poor South Africans. That's, uh, that's one of the problems in South Africa. Poor people are not seen as people with their own agency. They're seen yes. as these poor, poor uh, people Basket that, cases that, that be, we, yeah. they need help. And being poor is a... Uh, um, uh, condition. It's not a characteristic. Mm. People don't stay poor forever. If mm. if they get often, if they help themselves, but often if they also get help from other Absolutely. quarters. And that's one thing we've got to think of poor people as people who can make their own decisions. They don't th- need the government to babysit them. Mm. They can also think and do and make decisions for themselves and for their families, which are the best for them. 
Absolutely. Gentlemen, let me thank both of you for joining me. Uh, Dr. Johan Safontaine, of course, is a uh, senior consultant, <coughs> health consultant, and um, a fellow, let me call you a fellow at the Free Market Foundation. Thank you so much for joining me in this episode of the Big Liberty Show. Uh, Maurice, thank you, as Thanks always. Secret. And um, thank you for watching. But um, before I end the show, you've heard from the experts, you've heard from us here in studio, but the one people we, or the, the few people that we've never heard on from when it comes to the national health insurance are you, the public. So let's see what you guys had to say when I took to the streets to talk to you about the NHI. Hey guys, Big Daddy Liberty here. I'm coming to you from Rosebank and um, I'm about to be asking that question to ordinary South Africans around the national health insurance. Do they want to see a national health insurance? Do they believe politicians can run healthcare better than they can. These are the questions I'm going to be posing here and tonight. And um, I have something a little bit different and um, interesting for you guys. Bam! Um, over there. If you guys can see me, then join me for the conversation as we have that chat with ordinary South Africans. Do they want politicians to run their healthcare? Let's get the conversation going. Would you be, would you agree to a system like that? Yeah. So if we are in Engina, and just to a quick one. So for example, if we're not the hotel Elokshin or Yagena, Om Temba or Inganzaku Zagena, they might even say to that doctor, no, I was with Sebens a lap, for now Sebens a Karankua or wherever, because there's not enough doctors corner. Do you think government and politicians should have that kind of power to decide? As long as there's politics involved, man. Something else. Yeah. If we are cool, we are to see a Private doctor. Private um, doctor. So, I'm a politician, and I come to you and I say, no, I'm taking your medical aid away, and uh, I want you to go to your local clinic. Uh, and your local hospital, uh, and we decide where you go. Would you say yes to that idea? No, because even here in the hot town, it's full up with these outside people. Nigeria. Yeah. They yeah. can't get the medicine, they get the medicine, they don't buy, pay for the medicine, they don't pay for the medicine. Yeah. Um, ordinary people don't like the idea of being told where they can and can't go for their own health care, especially when they're spending their own money. Uh, let's see if I can get anybody else before the taxi moves the line along. Do you trust government to run your health care? That's ridiculous. Well, it's the plan that we have at the moment that's, that's being proposed. Would you agree to a politician telling you where to go for health care? No, I would not. Especially right. one that I didn't vote for. All right. Thanks, guys. There you have it. Politicians, they're losing this one. We'll keep the conversation going. No problem, no problem. Catch your train, girl. Do your thing. Hey, man, that train. Can't miss that train. Let's try these guys. Hey, guys, do you have 30 seconds to chat? No worries, no worries. Do you trust politicians to run your health care? In other words, your medical aid put into a government fund and them telling you where you can go for to get health care? No. Bad idea, good idea? No, bad idea. Do you trust government with controlling all of medical uh, uh, health care systems? No. Do you think it's a good idea for politicians to tell ordinary people like you and me where we can and can't go for healthcare? No. Well, I think you and I agree. No. All right, good luck. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you very much. Cheers. Well, there you have it. Ordinary people just saying, hell no. Do you trust politicians to run your healthcare? Yeah. Well, there you go. Thank you very much. Okay. Enjoy your day. Do you trust politicians with your healthcare? No. Well, you and I like. This is something that I think more engagement still needs to happen. And uh, I feel that uh, we shouldn't really be rushing in, into things. Yeah. Uh, one, my main concern is if you look at the, the government hospitals, so yeah. that is a big problem. Absolutely. Um, they still need to, to, to manage it effectively. So you cannot just uh, take this initiative yeah. at once uh, without having the government still needs to change Absolutely. the way they do things yeah. with the public health care. So, Final question, uh, I know you might be rushing for a train, yeah. but my, my concern with the NHI as it stands yeah. is that it doesn't address what you're talking about, which is the yeah. quality of public health care. Yeah. All it does is just add more bureaucracies yeah. to it. Is that, a really, is that really a good idea? I mean, we've seen, for example, just a random example, um, it will add these bureaucracies and then yeah. make it one healthcare fund, almost like ESCOM, right? Yes. Is yes. that a good idea? Or should we be putting it's all a, that it's, power? It's a very bad, bad idea. I mean, if you look at what the budget uh, they're saying, they're talking about uh, 500 billion or so. Yeah. That is a lot of, a lot of money. money. 
uh, for South Africa. Yeah. So I think the government now, mm. uh, personally, I believe that they should fix their stuff first. Absolutely. Before they, they, they go into into the, uh, the state. I don't know. Maybe. It depends how well the government like, allocates subsidies and that's it. Yeah. But if they don't and how government's been going, I wouldn't trust that. Yeah. My concern, if I may, um, we currently have a one provider for something, ESCOM, right? Yeah. They're a single provider for electricity and that has been a bit of a... An ESCOM are in debt of 250 billion. My concern, therefore, is that they're creating another ESCOM only for now the healthcare se sector. Mm -hmm. Do you trust this government with running something like this? Not really. it's, it's the idea of trust, right? Public confidence in something. Do people believe these politicians can run something like an NHI? Do you trust politicians to run your healthcare? No. Simple answer. Thanks a lot. Well, there you have it guys. I've spoken to South Africans as they are rushing home. You can see everybody trying to make it to the Khao train station. And the conversation was a simple one. Do you trust politicians with your healthcare? Does it fix the issue of a bad and ailing public healthcare system? Does adding a bureaucracy fix the issues of quality? These are the questions we posed to South Africans and the resounding answer is no. So clearly government has to go back to the drawing board and actually devise something or no, take a step back. Government needs to go back to the drawing board and actually begin to listen to, on the one hand, organizations that have alternatives to the NHI and also the public, the very people who this system is going to affect. And that conversation can only happen, as I said, if politicians are listening to the voice of people, including organizations like ours. You've been watching The Big Liberty Show. We're going to cross back to the studio. And this is my concern for you, the South African, is that we are introducing a system that doesn't fix healthcare, but instead definitely empowers and lines the pockets of politicians, entrepreneurs, and cronies. And at some stage, we have to draw the line as citizens and say, enough is enough. Let's hashtag stop the NHI. And um, you can do that by joining our campaign here at the IRR. Uh, you can find it online, irr.org.za, and look for the Stop NHI tab and you can be sign up to uh, have your voice heard around this campaign that we've got to look at alternatives we cannot keep uh, empowering the state and empowering politicians who actually really don't care about service delivery in, in the grand scheme of things um, you can become a part of that campaign and remember you can also support us, support our work um, by becoming a friend of the IRR that's our crowdfunding campaign that's the funds that we use to run campaigns to get content like this out to you guys, etc., etc. How do you become a friend of the IRR, you're asking? Well, you can do so by signing up um, online, the same website at irr.org.za uh, forward slash join, and you can sign up a monthly debit order of 90 Rand there. Hey, that's three cups of coffee in a month um, towards, and support, towards supporting the work that we do at the IRR and, of course, the work I do here at the Big Liberty Show. The other way you can do it, of course, is by SMSing your name to 32823. Uh, terms and conditions to apply, and SMS will cost you one rand. Guys, thank you so much for watching The Big Liberty Show. I really appreciate it. And remember, never trust a commie.